Welcome to Dateline Democracy and Media. My name is Dr. Ryan Broussard. I'm an assistant professor at Sam Houston State University in the Department of Mass Communication, and I'm your host today. So what is Dateline Democracy and Media? This is a special topics course at Sam Houston State University in which students have the opportunity to interview and meet top journalists and media professionals in different fields. It's also a chance for the students and professionals to discuss current events, national and world affairs. Students will also have an opportunity to ask questions of these top journalists about their careers and their journey to this point. Students are free to ask for advice, um, anything about their favorite topic related to the guest. Hopefully it's beneficial to these students because many of them are about to go out and launch their careers. This show is sponsored by the College of Arts and Media and the Department of Mass Communication here at Sam Houston State. Today's guest is Bill Brown, the play-by-play -play announcer with the Houston Astros for 30 years. Bill retired from behind the mic in 2016, stayed on with the Astros for a few more years and completely retired and in December. So welcome, Bill. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much, Ryan. Look forward to this and uh, to the interaction with the students. Good, good. So before we begin, I want to take a moment to recognize the man who created this program, Peter Roussel. Um, he's been a longtime faculty member here in the Department of Mass Communication. And due to non-COVID related health issues, he is unable to sit in the host chair this semester. He wanted to stress that it is not COVID related. He said, and I quote, I've been tested more times than a high school chemistry class. Um, so this is still his baby and I am just filling in for him. And I know I speak for everyone here when we wish him, um, as we wish him a speedy and full recovery. Now, Bill, um, you recently published a book called Sports Casting 101. It's actually the fifth book that you've published. I'm sure not a whole lot of people know that you're becoming a prolific writer. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the book and why you structured the book the way that you did? Yes, thank you. Um, well, the book is for you, you guys who are here right now and other students like you and other students to come, hopefully. Uh, we never know what the future is going to bring, but hopefully that book will be out there for sale for the next few years. And people will still know about it. Um, and I, I did some publicizing of it on social media, but there is a website, sportscasting101.com, that will completely explain the book and its purpose, but to be somewhat brief and, and still give you an idea of why the book was written. Um, this is a debt that I feel I owe because uh, when I was in your shoes, student shoes, um, you know, people, uh, who were in the profession came to class and spoke to us. And uh, this is uh, really continuing in that tradition. And, and it is also an effort to uh, try to repay people for all the many favors they've done for me throughout my career. If I could just pass something along that might be helpful to somebody, that's the purpose of the book. And it's not really about my career. It's about the careers of a lot of other people. Some of you, uh, some of them you may know, some of them you may not know. I chose not to uh, try to contact the biggest names in the business because a book like that's already been done. And I also feel that those people, uh, the Kurt Gowdy's of the world, the Jim Nances of the world, are for the most part the unreachable star for us. Uh, and I felt that way when I was a student. So I'd rather have you read the stories of people who started off at Sam Houston State, who uh, went to Temple University and then dropped out of school. Why? What happened after that? I think these are interesting stories and they may or may not be pertinent to your particular story, but I think we can all learn from them. I enjoyed reading those interviews. I, I had a chance to go through the book. You graciously sent me a copy. Uh, I enjoyed that the chapters were, were short, you broke it up, it, it's an easy read, it's very well done. Um, you interviewed like Todd Callis, your successor in the booth, and uh, Julia Morales, um, the sideline reporter and host on uh, Fox Sports. What was the biggest thing that one of the people you interviewed told you, or what was the thing that you took away the most from talking with them? That, that's. Um you know, the question that I really need to answer, and I'm still kind of 
struggling because, uh, you know, there were 20, 20 some odd people interviewed in the book. So they come at you from different angles. They have different stories. But, the, you know, I, I think the thing that Eric Nadell pointed out that uh, and he's the voice of the Texas Rangers. He's in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, Bill Schoening did the same thing. He's the voice of the San Antonio Spurs is the need to be well-rounded, to not only learn about sports and develop contacts in the world of sports, but also just throughout life in general, uh, because you never know where your career is going. So they stress reading, they stress um, being a uh, news reporter. And, and that was my entree into the business, was being a news reporter rather than a sports reporter. Uh, because, you know, your career may take on an uncertain direction and the more broad-based your preparation is, the better you will be prepared for those sharp twists and turns that you may be encountering. So you're also now working on your sixth book. Um, talked a little bit about it the other day when we, we talked before this, and it's tentatively titled, you've told me, 60. Um, and it kind of works in last year's 60 game shortened season and the Astros 60th anniversary. So can you talk a little bit about that and why you wanted to do that book? Because your other books besides Sportscasting 101 have been mostly like history books and looking at the history of the Astros and Jose Altuve and those types of books. Um, so can you talk about just kind of what made you decide to go with this as your next? And as you said, your final uh, <laughs> book. Right. I kind of, you know, I'm not trying to end this era of Astros baseball. I'd like it to continue forever. But uh, as we all know, sports eras do come to an end and uh, the team is, is getting a little bit older and has some tough choices to make. I'm not wishing that on the team, but uh, I'm just trying to wrap up, you know, my, my phase as a writer of covering the different eras of this team. That's what this book is all about. So 2020, very unexpected, not a, not a good regular season, but then a great playoff run. And uh, 2021 is looking pretty good on paper, but somebody else will have to pick up the history of the, of the team after this. I just wanted to try to, to put the whole, this will be the 60th year of the team. So put, put that whole period of time in perspective. There are some timelines, there are timelines of the coronavirus Last year, leading up to the start of the baseball season, there are timelines of 1962, the first year of the team, what else was going on in the world in 1962, try to put that in some perspective. So I, I think, you know, the older we get, the more we're interested in that perspective and trying to appreciate what we have, but also put it in some kind of a context for what was going on 30, 40 years ago, that kind of thing. And that's the purpose of it. I had fun doing it, but uh, it's time to quit writing books. So <laughs> this is going to be it. <laughs> um, and, and you mentioned how you kind of begin the book with the Astro sign stealing scandal. And I'm not going to talk about it, but don't think you get out of it because we have students coming up later who want to ask you about it. Um, but my question to you is, these are mass communication students uh, who are going to ask you questions. Um, and some of them will go on into hopefully lengthy writing careers. Can you talk about your writing and research process and how you approach uh, writing these books and researching them? Great question, Ryan. And um, I did some sports writing uh, when I was in high school. And of course, uh, we, we had great journalism classes at the University of Missouri. But then going into the broadcasting end of the business, I had not done writing for, for many, many years. And then as my career developed and, and sort of got toward the end and final five, six years, maybe I started writing books because I realized I had put in enough years uh, here in Houston and with the Astros to develop the contacts, to do interviews of people about things that happened 20, 30 years ago and, and try to tie that together. There had never been an Astros history book until about seven years ago. And uh, uh, an associate of mine and I, Mike Acosta and I, put our efforts together on that book. And then I decided to just sort of, sort of stay on that theme and, and add to the history of the book, which that only, that history only went through 2012. So there have been 
uh, succeeding books attempting to kind of update the uh, era since then. And I, I could be better at writing, I will be honest with you. My writing is very simple. I'm glad that you thought it was a good read. That's what I'm shooting for. I'm not complex at all. I know my limitations, I think, as a writer, and it's going to be simple if I write it. And I, I find that that brings a little clarity. I think it makes it a little bit easier to deal with topics if you're simplifying them and not going off onto a tangent that may not be interesting to people. And, and yeah, I've tried to develop a little bit different style, Ryan, of a storyteller type style. And that's what I tried to develop on the air as well. It's very difficult to tell stories during a baseball game, but uh, a baseball game lends itself to that more than any other sport. So I think those of us who have been fortunate to be in the business for many years tend to think that that's kind of what the public expects of us. And we gravitate toward that and try to become better at telling stories. And I, I love doing it. Uh, and I love doing it in the book format as well because of the lack of, of limitations with the time on the air, you know, between pitches and things like that. <laughs> well, and simple sentences are, are sometimes the best. That's what we tell our students. You don't have to get overly complex, short, simple, declarative sentences um, are, are the best to tell stories sometimes, and, and you don't need to get overly complex. So I, I'm glad that you are telling them the same thing that we're telling them. Because uh, right. sometimes we can say it till we're blue in the face, but when someone else comes in and says it, it's like, oh, the light bulb goes off. <laughs> right, and I do think an outline is the best way to work on putting a book together. It, it will change. Uh, from your original outline, but, um, you know, you don't want to take off driving to uh, New Mexico without a roadmap, and I think you need a roadmap at least in the beginning, and then you can certainly veer off once you're within a chapter, you'll add and subtract things of that nature, but um, I, I do think an outline is uh, absolutely required. You hear stories of the links that some writers go to to force themselves to sit in front of the computer, or in some cases, the typewriter, locking themselves in kind of a shed for six hours a day. Um, how do you do that? Do you, how do you kind of have the, the will and the fortitude to sit there and the concentration to sit there and write for a certain amount of time? I, th I think part of that, Ryan, is because it's a simplistic writing style, I don't sit here and agonize over vocabulary all that much. I just tend to, you know, with, with the journalistic uh, demands of constant deadlines, when I would write uh, something for, you know, somebody wanted something for the game program and there wasn't a whole lot of notice on that, or uh, when I was writing an article for any kind of a publication, generally there wasn't a lot of time. Uh, therefore, I tend to just try to get it out. Quickly, and then I'll go back and revise it, but just get, get the thoughts on paper in an organized way and then go back and try to polish it later. But um, I don't want to be sitting there agonizing over this word, that word. And, you know, the editing process is important too, because things become apparent when you're editing that were not apparent when you were writing and, and the need to go back and oh, I use this word four different times in this paragraph. That, that's not going to work, that kind of thing. Uh, but I, I think, um, you know, part of it is you really have to like what you're doing. And if you like what you're doing, you wake up in the morning just, just like doing baseball. Uh, you have 162 games. Uh, if you don't like what you're doing, it's going to be an awful long season. But if you absolutely love what you're doing, even though your team may be in a terrible season and you're in last place and, you know, it doesn't look like there's any way out as far as having a meaningful year, that's when it's up to you as a journalist to come up with some storylines, to try to plot out what the fans might want to hear about maybe not. You know, for instance, in 2013, we had a terrible team. We lost 111 games. But we were constantly showing these grainy video clips from the Internet about, oh, George Springer was a double A last night and he hit three home runs. So we were diverting the viewer from what they were seeing on television and looking toward the future. Well, that's what we were all about then because this team was not about now. It was about the future. And, and part of our job, we felt the producer and I and the people on the air 
Uh, Julia Morales was great at it, at, at, uh, at trying to keep people entertained. It was not, hey, we're losing 10 to 1 in the eighth inning, but oh, well, so and so is really having a big month at Corpus Christi, and he might be here in September. That kind of thing. Uh, so it's, it's about uh, trying to, to get yourself motivated. Uh, to get up every day and say, well, I, I haven't finished this chapter yet. That's what I need to do today. And if it takes three hours, that's fine. Or if it takes 45 minutes, that's fine too. But I need to finish it and I need to give it the proper amount of time so that I'm not just stopping and rushing off to do something else that's more important. This is the most important thing I'm doing today. So everything else has to be structured around it. Okay. okay. So, so you talked about kind of the length, these long seasons and Major League Baseball season is in normal times, 162 games and roughly a, a shade under 190 days. As an announcer, what's, how do you keep your voice in tip top shape calling five, four, five, six games a week? I devote a little time uh, in the book to that. Uh, it's pretty basic, but Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Um, and my voice is not really all that strong, so I constantly have to uh, sip on water, take a break when I get it. You know, in baseball, you have a partner who does a lot of talking. There's plenty of time there to regroup. Uh, but also, I think there's the need to train your voice. And in order to do a three-hour broadcast, of which you might be talking for you know, 45 minutes, I don't know. I don't know how much the play-by-play -play talks on TV during a three hour game, I have no idea, but, but usually it's in, you know, 20 second bursts or 30 second bursts. It's not for five straight minutes. That, that is not the job. So it's a matter of building up vocal strength and that happens through singing. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to be good at singing, but you can close the door and go in a room and sing because that builds up voice strength. It really does. And hopefully you'll like to sing and, you know, take your favorite boom box in there and go at it. But um, other than that, talking, you know, forcing yourself to verbalize and uh, people get tired of hearing you talk, go out in the backyard and just talk. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, when I, would, when I would get ready, Ryan, for uh, spring training, I would realize, hey, I haven't talked all winter. I haven't been on the air except for a talk show here and there all winter long. It's been four or five months. I've got to do a radio game next week. That means that every day between now and next week, I need to be talking for at least an hour and a half. And not, you know, 30 minutes here and 30 more minutes four hours later. No, an hour and a half. So whether I'm reading the newspaper and I want to read that out loud or whatever it is, I need to be verbalizing. I need to be using this voice because my voice is not strong enough to sound good for a spring training game the way I sound right. Okay. So, well, your voice to Astros fans um, is synonymous with the team. And you've called some major milestones, uh, both personally for different players and for the team. I mean, you were there for Jeff Bagwell's 400th home run, Craig Biggio's 3,000th hit, um, four no-hitters in team history. Which one of those games or calls in particular stands out to you the most? I, I would say Craig Biggio's 3,000th hit got the most notoriety, of course, and, and that one does stand out. But I, I love no-hitters because on TV – Rather than on radio, you, you know, you're going crazy on radio. That's, that's your job. But on TV, restraint, lay out, let the, let the crowd carry it. Crowd's going crazy. Say nothing for 30 seconds. And that takes some restraint. But it's, you know, I, I think it's the best way to handle it on television. I don't think people want to hear the announcer going ballistic. If you've, if you've done your job, which is build up to that moment, and uh, Mike fires through a no-hitter in uh, 2015, mm -hmm. and the producer reminded me when we were doing this, this book, Sportscasting 101, I had forgotten. But in the, after the eighth inning, we did not take a commercial break. 
because he had assembled highlights of several of the recent Astros no-hitters going back about 10 years. And he just rolled them one after another. And we talked about each one very briefly, about 10 seconds on each one. And uh, I had, I just was going from a list in the media guide. And then, you know, maybe a couple things that I remembered would pop into my mind as, as they roll. Um, and, and so we set the stage and now we come out and fires has three more outs until he gets his no hitter. Well, by then there's no need to say a lot. There really isn't. Uh, on the Biggio 3000 hit, it was the same, you know, we're setting the stage had been set for months as he's doing this countdown. And then that night he needed three hits to get to 3000 and he got five hits as it turned out. But on the uh, first hit, of course, you start building and then the second hit, now it could be next time up. So um, that, that's just a kind of an ongoing storytelling device type of uh, approach. And then um, I, I really did not do a very good job uh, calling it because I was so excited about it. You know, I, mean, I, I watched his whole career. I'm so excited for him and we had a sellout crowd and I was so excited for them. I just started calling it like a radio game and I just, uh, I lost, I, you know, I just kind of lost my presence that I should have throttled way back and not done the description that I did because people could see what I was saying. And that's a, that's a bad call for TV. It's fine for radio, but, um, but you know, uh, you, you just, sometimes the emotion takes you and you can't restrain yourself. And that was one of those times. <laughs> okay. The one that sticks out for me was the, the six pitcher effort in 2003 when Roy Oswalt, that was a little different buildup because with Mike Fires, who, which was the first in Minute Maid Park first no hitter, this one, you had new pitchers coming in every few innings. What was that like, just trying to keep that yeah. going? Yeah, that's, um, that was unlike any other game I've ever done because of that, because those all got hurt and the other guys were not geared to pitch, you know, four or five innings at a time. So it was a succession of the six. And then um, here, here was another element. My boss, the director of broadcasting, did not want me to say that they had a no-hitter going in progress. Because Milo Hamilton, who was doing games on the radio, never said. It. So now you you know you you're yoked with this restraint of not being able to tell a viewer who has just switched over and is watching your game. You need to let he or she know, hey, there's a no hitter going, folks. But you can't say no hit because your boss doesn't want you to. So um, I would uh, use all the techniques I copied from Milo. Well, you know, the Astros have, uh, or the, you know, we're playing the uh, Yankees. The Yankees have um, nothing but zeros on the scoreboard, you know, no runs, no hits, no errors, or Yankees have had only two base runners, both on walks. So you use all, all this little code language to avoid saying no hitter, but you can't really say no hitter. That was a challenge. <laughs> when were you allowed to say no hitter? Or when did you first say it? I said it when Mike Scott had a no-hitter going, I think it was in 1990, and there was one out in the ninth inning, and I had been saying that he had a no-hitter several times. Interesting point, because Gene Elston, who was the original voice of the Astros, uh, who did the job for 25 years, had always told people there was a no-hitter. He always said, I believe as a journalist, I needed to say it. And because of the audience change over all the time, you know. Uh, and so it was, it was just obvious. No, you, you tell them it's a no-hitter. Well, no, because Milo doesn't do it, and we and we think you might be jinxing him. Well, so the, uh, Ken Overfell got a hit off Mike Scott with one out in the ninth inning. He gets a one-hitter. So this is when we had the conversation. We really don't want you to say no-hitter. And so I asked Mike Scott – a couple of weeks later, hey, does that bother you? Said, Absolutely not. We don't, it's no big deal to the players. We don't care. What, we don't know what you're saying. It's, you're not jinxing us. But those were my marching orders. Okay. You know, you know what, though, Ryan? Uh, the further we went and the more of those no-hitters and no-hit bids we had, I just had fun with it because I thought, well, there's, there's no way I can change this. You can't fight City Hall. Um, 
but I'm going to have some fun with it. And we, we just, we would try to talk around it and give every kind of clue we could without saying it. And I have to admit, it was um, a challenge. Oh, good, good. That, that, that's very interesting. Uh, so enough questions from me. Let's start bringing in the students uh, who have prepared some questions for you. Uh, so first up, we have Alora. She has a few questions for you. Good afternoon, Mr. Brown. Thank you for being here. Um, our class really appreciates it. Thank you, Alora. Um, can you describe what it was like broadcasting on radio and television for the troops during the Vietnam War? Yeah, that was a, a very weird uh, situation, but a great situation for me. Um, when I had worked in San Antonio, before I was drafted into the military, I was doing news reporting. So, I, you know, they, they would not let me on camera to do weekend sports because they said I looked too young. Okay, I thought we were supposed to be appealing to a young audience. Well, it's a credibility thing. Could you grow a mustache? No, I can't grow a mustache. So uh, that never happened. And then I got drafted, went to Vietnam, and uh, I went to, uh, first of all, Long Ben and worked there for a while, just uh, interviewing troops. And I would go travel around to a fire base and, uh, you know, interview uh, Private Smith. And then we'd send the tape of that interview uh, back to his hometown radio station. So that was my job for about four or five months. Then I transferred to AFBN in Saigon. And that's where I was a sportscaster. So we would do, I think we did two 15 minute radio sportscasts every day and maybe two five minute radio sportscasts. And then we did uh, two TV sportscasts every day. So it was a really hectic, busy job. And we were uh, reporting uh, you know, NBA scores from last night and uh, Super Bowl previews and, you know, anything that people would be doing here in the States. But the difference being the troops were not really accessible. You know, if they're on a fire base, they're not watching TV. So they're listening to radio and that's how they get their updates from back home. And, you know, they've got some money riding on Tampa Bay here in the Super Bowl. And they want, you know, it was that kind of a human level. So uh, I thought it was a really important job, you know, to get the sports news to the troops. And we even had an interview opportunity. Um, Bobby Bonds, Barry Bonds' father, had had a good year. And he came over on a, a USO tour. And I interviewed him on some shows. So um, there, there were some good opportunities uh, for airtime and all that. But I, I thought it was... Uh, <laughs> Honestly, Alora, it was better training for what I was about to do when I got back to the States than my job in San Antonio was. Awesome. Um, I know you mentioned that one interview, but um, what was the story or interview that stands out to you most from Vietnam? Um, we, we didn't feel threatened physically that much. We had a few alerts when we had to spend the night at the station because we were afraid there might be an attack somewhere in downtown Saigon, there was some of that going on then, but uh, we, we never had any bombings or anything like that that were close to us. And I think it was just um, simply the fact that we felt blessed to be uh, working in an air-conditioned building, doing what all of us really wanted to do. And, uh, you know, when I landed on that, on that plane in uh, Long Bend when I first arrived in Vietnam, I didn't know if I was going to be fighting out in the jungle or what I was going to be doing. So believe me, I felt very blessed every day at that station that I had that job. That's great. And now for a lighter topic, um, what type of experience or skill set is required for a successful career in sports media? And how can we start preparing ourselves now for a career in sports media? Well, I think for you, Laura, and your generation, uh, certainly the ability to uh, deal with social media is extremely important. That, that came along pretty late in my job and it was important for me to do that too. And the job that I had, I, I think writing, I think editing, uh, shooting video, these are all extremely, I, I think you need to um, really be very much more well-rounded than I was when I came out of school. Um, and you know, your ability to, to speak, to do interviews that are recorded uh, now that's, that's a big thing for anybody in the profession, whether you see yourself as an on-air person or not, you may wind up on the air or you're probably going to wind up on social media talking to somebody. So, um, training yourself in that area, training yourself in the area of writing, 
in uh, photography, um, just, just being a very well-rounded, knowledgeable person is extremely important. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to answer my question. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Talk to Laura. You. Um, next up, we have Joseph Taylor. Hi, Mr. Brown. First and foremost, I just want to say thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, my question is, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed how games and teams are covered, including the curtailing of clubhouse access for media and interviews moved from in-person to teleconference. How have these factors changed the way teams and games are covered? I think they've changed dramatically. I was talking to uh, the Astros broadcasters, and they would typically record um, an interview that would be done with the player, I think, in the clubhouse, and sometimes the broadcaster would be would be at home at two o'clock in the afternoon for a seven o'clock game. And uh, of course they were not allowed in the clubhouse, as you've indicated, um, had no personal contact with the players. And that makes the job a lot more difficult when you're unable to have that conversation around the batting cage or when a player comes out and he's on the bench getting ready to go out on the field. You might get a quick word with him 15, 20 seconds, or, or it might be more than that. Um, and just, so not being allowed to be on the field uh, limited the uh, impromptu conversations that, that would become important and might be used during a broadcast. Uh, being limited to just going straight to the broadcast booth was, was very difficult. And then doing the games themselves off a monitor when the team is on the road, uh, very weird, very weird. Uh, I think... The guys told me that they just had to uh, wait and pause a little bit longer because on a deep fly ball to the outfield, if you're in the stadium, you have a pretty good sense of whether it might be a home run or not. But, but now, none whatsoever. You know, off the video monitor, you see the ball leave the bat, go up in the air. You just have to wait and then see what the shot is of the outfielder going back, and then you still – you can't see the baseball, so you have to wait a little bit longer on your call. And uh, that's not that easy for someone as a play-by-play -play guy who's used to just trying to be on top of it at all times. You simply have to back off. That's the only way to handle it. Okay. So I guess that kind of like answers my second question in a way, which was, do you feel like the media coverage of teams and players has gotten better or worse? I think, um, I, I think they've gotten worse because, um, you know, after a game, we'll say the Astros win, uh, media relations may bring one or two players out to the press conference room podium to be interviewed by everyone on a Zoom type interview. And uh, that means everyone else is not available and uh, no, no reporters are allowed in the clubhouse. So it just, that, that limiting of availability really, really hurts. I, I, I don't think the coverage can possibly be nearly as good with that condition. And then my last question will be, not counting the changes from the pandemic, what would you say are the biggest differences in sports announcing today compared to when, you're, when you first started your career? Technology. Um, you know, when, when we started, uh, when I was in Cincinnati, I had a little uh, audio tape recorder I'd carry around and do audio tapes with the players before the game. And then I'd take it to the engineer in the production truck and said, I'd like to have you play this 20-second this soundbite of this player when he's batting. And we did that. And, you know, Tony Kubek was doing it on NBC. And uh, that, that, But now, you know, there'd be, there'd be video of the player you roll in. Uh, there, there are video cameras all over the place to be able to tape these things and roll them in. Uh, the, the tape machines are so much more sophisticated. Uh, there are so many ways to use replay now from different angles and slow-mos. Uh, the microphones make the game sound so much better. You know, a, a network telecast of a World Series game has microphones in the bases. It just incredible uh, with the explosion of technology what that has done you know, audio sounds better you know the broadcasters sound better um, cameras have come a long way uh, the zoom ratio is much better uh, so these cameras can really get up close um, 
And it's it's all to the benefit of the listeners and the viewers. It's, it's been fantastic. I, you know, I wanted to do a book, Joseph, on um, technology during my lifetime. And a friend of mine said, you would need about two years to do the research on that. End of idea. Just to Thank you so much. real quickly, um, do you think that the improvements in technology have um, allowed you to have more information about the players with the internet and you have more stats and information available? Has that kind of broadened the depth um, of information you have to call a game? I'm really glad you asked that because I should have spoken to that. Uh, that has been really the biggest change because now in the production truck, we have all these esoteric statistics and, you know, uh, we have to explain them to casual fans. And I've had debates with the producer about this. And, you know, one producer said, no, you don't. We'll just put them up on the screen. I said, no, you can't do that. Uh, people don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and we, we must explain them if you're going to put them up. So now as a broadcaster, that limits me to go where I want to go. Maybe I want to tell a story about somebody, but no, there's this graphic on the screen. And I need to explain that before I spend time on the story. So, yeah, I, and I think, you know, it, it's interesting, if, you know, the different statistics they'll show, um, launch angle and things like that. So being an older guy and an old school guy and not being probably as entertained as you are by these techniques, I, I think it's overdone. I think it's definitely overbaked. I think that it can be throttled back a little bit, still be effective. Uh, but you're talking about somebody who was dragged kicking and screaming into this era too of technology. So some of us are slow to adjust, but yeah, that's all, all the things that are shown on the screen that are attempts to entertain I think that's been the biggest change of all. Okay. Thank you so much, Thank Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, next, we have Jacob, Jacob Courtney. Hello. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Bill Brown, for coming sure. to this uh, little meeting. And uh, I'll, I'll have to shave my mustache off in order to get the opportunities that, you, that you've had in life. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a good thing, Jacob. It gives you credibility. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. Uh, but my first actual question uh, is, what was your biggest fear or mistake you felt like you would have made when announcing your first professional game and how did you overcome it? Uh, I think saying the obvious is what we all fall victim to. And um, I'm sure I was guilty of that because um, of nervousness probably. And I think the way to overcome it is just by more experience, um, by doing more games. And yeah, I, I tell young people who are not on the air, but they want to be on the air, take your tape recorder out to a high school game and sit there and do it. Um, set up in the bleachers in the corner if you're worried about bothering people or, or wherever you select. Or, or, you know, you can't get to a game, turn down the volume on your TV set and do it at home. But the main idea is to make these mistakes in that kind of a venue rather than on the air. And we all make mistakes on the air. It's, it's that kind of a job. And the public is, to me, very forgiving of us and our mistakes. But if you can eliminate some of those mistakes that are eliminated by experience, uh, and you might say, well, it's not experience to be sitting, you know, on the bleachers of a high school game doing it. Yeah, it is. It is. If you take it seriously, if, if in your mind, I'm on the air right now, that's the game I'm playing with myself. I'm on the air. And if I start talking and it's not going well, I just, I'm going to start all over again. No, no, not, not in this game we're playing here. You don't start over again. When you say you're on the air, you're on the air lot. That's the way you need to approach it. And if you do, uh, you're going to understand, okay, I blew that, but I got to keep talking here. I, I've got to get out of this mess that I've created. And uh, it'll make you better for that. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, are there any ethical issues or contra controversies you had to overcome during your broadcasting career? 
there are ethical issues and I think um, some of those uh, require you to understand when somebody tells you something in confidence and needs some confidence. And um, so uh, I think one thing I write in my book I was talking between innings one time about a player and uh, what I said wasn't real complimentary. I meant it in kind of a joking way. I was just talking to myself more than than anything, but uh, I did not realize the audio was on in the clubhouse and players were listening to this because nobody had told me that they left our mics on between innings. So I had to apologize to that player. So that's, that's you know, one issue that I can bring to light for you that happened to me. And there have been other times too when, uh, you know, the players' families will listen very carefully. And uh, sometimes a player will say, hey, did you say this about me or whatever? And and um, he's, he would have gotten a different report than what I actually said sometimes, or sometimes I needed to apologize. So you know what I mean? Things, things get twisted and turned because the loved ones don't quite listen to every word you say. They're, they're hearing something they think is negative, and that's what gets reported. Back to the guys. So, yeah, you, you know, uh, we, we are um, to be very careful with our words, uh, words are important. Words matter. Words can hurt people. And that's a part of the responsibility, ethically, I think, of doing a game. Okay. Final question. Uh, how do skills in sports announcing translate to print journalism or vice versa? Um, in my case, I think, you know, just the idea of consciously choosing words, whether they're verbal or written, is the same. The idea of expressing a thought is a little different because um, of the manner of uh, speaking and colloquialisms and think of that, things of that nature that we can get by with as broadcasters using the spoken word uh, that doesn't play so well in print. So um, I, I see print as a, a more formal presentation than what we do verbally as broadcasters. But um, another part of broadcasting, as you are well aware, is the intonation and the inflection and things of that nature that do not play in print and are not a consideration whatsoever. But I, I think in general, there's more time in print to consider what you're writing than there is in broadcasting to consider what you're saying. There's more time and you can use it wisely. Okay. All righty. Thanks so much, Jacob. Um, next up, we have Jessa Knox. Hi. Hi, Jessa. Um, so my first question is, you mentioned that you started uh, in the news reporting field. So when did you realize that you wanted to go into sports announcing, like into the sports media industry? Uh, when I was 14, that's when I realized that's what I wanted to do. So in other words, I was a very, very focused tunnel vision and probably to detriment, I would say, because then when something else came along and that was my job, like news reporting, uh, I didn't uh, see that as being uh, in the direction I wanted to go. In other words, that was a, that was a diversion that I was not welcoming. And um, so I had to try to apply myself to do the best I could, of course, in that way, but then in another way, if I had been thinking all along a little more open-minded, then uh, perhaps I, I would have done a better job of news report. Who knows? Okay. Uh, my second question is, uh, being in the industry for so long and having such a successful career, um, what's one piece of information you wish you knew like earlier in the industry um, compared to like now? Um, I've always been pretty serious, but I, I think a sense of humor plays very well. Um, and uh, so if I had if I had had a better sense of humor or expressed it, that may have been helpful. Um, but you know it, that does come out when you're working with colleagues and, and word gets around. You know, the, the thing about it is it's um, it seems like a large industry, but it's really pretty small. Um, if you're in a market like Houston, which is which is one of the biggest broadcasting markets in the country, uh, it's still, you know, there aren't that many people doing what you do. And um, so, you, you know, need to understand, I, I think one thing 
that I could have understood more uh, when I was your age was that, uh, hey, you know, nobody knows who I am. Well, yeah, it's, it's not that big a universe you're in. They, they're going to learn who you are, whether they're at another station or not. So building those relationships, building those friendships, it might not be anybody at your station. You're looking on the ladder you want to climb at your station, but you may be going across town in two years to work for some other station. And it might just be that somebody who's developing a friendship with you from that other station is going to help you get a job someday. Yeah. <laughs> um, and my last question, which I think you kind of answered for Jacob was, um, what were some of your biggest fears going into the industry and like how you overcame them? Well, yeah, I think we're all a little self-conscious of, you know, maybe, maybe your nose is a little too large in your opinion, you know, or maybe, you know, I mean, we all have our own little idiosyncrasies that, that we, well, my voice might not be good enough or I don't express myself well enough, my vocabulary, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I think when you're on camera, you tend to be a little self-conscious in the beginning, especially. And instead of thinking about, well, this is the job I need to do. This is what I need to talk about. This is what I need to say. We get all hung up on appearance and things of that nature uh, if we're on television rather than just uh, being, uh, I think, a little more laid back, uh, which, is, which is hard to be when it's your first big you know, assignment on the air and you, you can't blow it. Well, that's a negative thing. But uh, if, if, you're, if you're of the mindset of, hey, I have something to report here, I have something to offer here, and uh, I, I really think this is important, so let me focus on that and do the best job I can. That usually is a pretty good way to go. All righty. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask you these questions. I really thank you, Jessa. It. Thank you. Thanks, Jessa. Okay, next up, we have uh, PJ. Hi, well, like you said, my name is PJ. Um, I'm super excited to uh, even be able to talk to you, uh, especially as, uh, well, a Houston native, but also as a rookie. So uh, I think it's awesome that you're willing to share your wisdom with us. So. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate that. So um, my first question is, um, I wanna know what did it take for people to take you seriously or take a chance on you at the beginning of your career? Um, I had an interesting interview at the University of Missouri for an internship. And there were, I think, two days worth of interviews uh, to get this internship in San Antonio, Texas. And it was a matter of, now, now get this, um, there were two gentlemen interviewing me and it was an hour interview. So we chit-chatted for about 10 minutes and then they said, well, we're gonna put you to work. This guy here, Buddy Baker, is a tugboat captain and it's World War II. And he's just piloted a tugboat across the Atlantic Ocean. You're standing on the docks at Newport News, Virginia, interviewing him. You have three minutes to interview him. Click. Stopwatch starts. At the end of that three minutes, all right, go out to the newsroom uh, typewriter and type up a story for the evening news. Okay. So you bring in the copy. Okay, now sit behind the desk and read the story as if you're doing the evening news. And the final part of the process was go stand in the corner without any notes and do a stand-up report. Well, I, of course, felt completely apart on that. And I think we all did. And uh, so that, to me, reinforced the point. It's, it's competition here. <laughs> they're, they're putting everybody through the exact same test here. And uh, it's, it's all about performance. That's all it comes down to. And it probably, you know, now in the case of, I, I don't know what you want to do, but it may be submitting uh, written articles, you know, or, or, or you tell me, what do you want? What would you like to do with your life? Well, uh, I would like a job in general, but um, ideally I would love to work on the news. Uh, I, would, I would honestly love to work in sports too. Um, I've been doing some play-by-play uh, -play, uh, color, uh, color commentating type stuff uh, for the school. Uh, so, and I love that. It's so much fun. So, you know, hopefully something along the lines of that or, or even uh, working at a radio station. I love music and I, you know, I just, I don't know that the, the media also has always been, you know, and performing and speaking and stuff is, 
has always been, um, you know, a part of my life. So I just, I'd like to keep incorporating that. Right. Well then I think you're doing uh, an excellent job of creating that path for where you want to go. Thank and you. Um, that's, that's what I try to do exactly what you're doing. Thank you. So I would keep it up. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, um, I guess my final question is, and, uh, it's a little bit surface, but, um, what do you want people to remember you by? Oh boy. Um, that's, that's pretty deep actually <laughs> for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, um, you know, in the end, in the end, maybe not even for being a sports broadcaster, you know, um, I think it depends on whether it's your friends, uh, your acquaintances, people at church, um, different different friendships in different areas of your life. Uh, certainly not for what I did on the golf course, I promise you that. Um, but, the, you know, just I, I think hopefully that you help some other people along the way. That would be probably number one above any other kind of award or achievement or anything like that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for talking to me. Thank nice you, PJ. You. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thanks, PJ. Okay, uh, next up, we have Courtney Cleveland. Hello. Hi, Courtney. Hi, thank you for being here with us today. So my first question is, what was the biggest difference between working for the Cincinnati Reds compared to working for the Houston Astros? Interesting question, because... Um, with the Reds job, I worked for the TV station that televised the Reds games. With the Astros job, I worked for the team. And there is a big difference. I would much rather work for the team because you're more likely to be privy to some inside information about, you know, uh, meetings that you've had with, with your boss or, you know, um, you don't meet with the manager of the team but yeah. the fact that you're an employee of the team means you may be making some appearances with the manager of the team or the general manager or doing shows with them so it's a closer association there, there's more closeness there and that could lead to a little bit more trust between you and those people or players um, and that means just a, a better friendship a better relationship and uh and then that trust of where you know that this guy, okay, he told me something, and I don't think he wants me to talk about this on the air, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, rather than being the, you know, when I was working for the TV station, you're, you're more in this journalist role, right? Well, oh, well, I can report this now before anybody else, you know. And, and uh, so there is a difference between the two. I don't think it's all that large a difference, but there is one. Yes. Okay, well, my next question is, what is your best advice for someone who aspires to be a sports broadcaster but gets extremely nervous talking on air or in front of a lot of people? I think just uh, more repetitions. Um, you know, for instance, we, we usually are nervous about things that we haven't done very much. So when I did, um, you know, the TV sports casting job in Cincinnati, and I was still pretty young then, uh, if I got asked to uh, talk to a group, I was always nervous about that because, you know, and, and our job, you're in a studio, you've got a microphone, you're not looking at faces. Yeah. That's not what you're used to. Yeah. And now you show up, you know, you're looking at, a, we'll say, a classroom, and, you know, three or four people. Are in this <laughs> it's just a little unnerving, you know, and you're thinking, well, I hope they're not doing this when I'm doing a game, but they, but they are. <laughs> you just don't see them. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I think that's that's where the nervousness comes from. And so you may have to force yourself to do some of these things that um, create the nervousness. You know, and I'll tell you another thing, Courtney, um, my biggest worry, the, the further I got into my career was not being nervous. Because if we're about ready to go on and do a game and I'm thinking, well, you know, we got to travel and we'll get home at three o'clock in the morning. And I just hope this game goes quickly, you know, you're on the West Coast or something like that. It's a totally negative, not what you want. Yeah. Negative mindset. Uh, but if your team is in first place and you're playing the second place team and there's a, a lot going on, 
you're keyed up a little bit more. Um, that nervousness is something you can funnel into energy and into doing a better job, maybe concentrating better. Um, or, you know, as Ryan was talking about earlier, when, when you're doing baseball, you're doing you know, 162, uh, you're not always going to feel your best. Yeah. Uh, you're not always going to be concentrating the same way. And you kind of have to, in my opinion, you need to talk yourself into some things here. Hey, this game is more important than I may think. And, you know, somebody's going to be watching their first game today, and this yeah. might be it. Or somebody's family might be watching for the first time. And so you use all these little mental tricks to get yourself up for the game uh, because you realize, hey, this, this is you know, it's my job. If yeah. I'm not into this, how can I expect anybody out there listening to be into this? And so I've got to use whatever techniques I can to get myself up for this as being a really important broadcast. So I think nervousness can be very good, actually. That's it's great. Just, I didn't even look at it like that, but thank you for that. So my I just want to jump in, jump in real quick, uh, just a follow up. Sorry, Courtney. Did you get nervous before every game? Did you have butterflies before every game? No, I didn't. But um, if I did have butterflies, I usually did a better game. Like an opening day kind of thing. Oh, I love that. I, I just, it got to the point, you know, in the beginning, I hated being nervous, but then as the years went by, I liked being nervous because that meant it really meant something to me. And it should mean something to you. <laughs> it really should. Yeah. I like that. Okay. So my last question is what was the hardest part of your retirement? Um, well, when I retired, you know, we were about to win the World Series the next year, and I knew that we had a very good team, and so it was the timing of it. Should we stay another year? Yeah. And, they, and they would have let me do that, but I just thought, no. This is, uh, once this decision is made, it's made, it's not reversible, and they're going to get, you know, hundreds of people are going to be lined up for this job, so I have to make absolutely sure and that was the hardest part about it. I was ready to go because I felt that I was just at that age and at that time in life, fortunate to be healthy, wanted to do some things in retirement with my wife and grandkids and what have you, that, um, yeah, it's, it's time to do this now. But I had to wait an extra month or two to make sure this was absolutely certain in my mind and that I was willing to do it. And it worked out great. I, they did win the world championship the next year but I completely signed on to the fact that that might happen yeah that's great that's great well that's all I have thank you for answering my question thank you Courtney no problem. thanks Courtney um next up we have Briselli Asensio good afternoon I'm Briselli and I'm pleased to meet you pleased to meet you Briselli okay so my first question for you is when did you realize that what you do behind the microphone makes a difference I, I don't know if I've realized it yet. Um, you know, people will come up and say things and I just, uh, you, you don't realize. Um, but I think if you're fortunate enough to have a job for a long time and lucky enough that, that people are paying attention and want to watch the team or whatever the situation might be, um, it's, pr it's probably something that, that becomes known to you long after the fact that, hey, I grew up watching you or I grew up watching Astros baseball. And uh, I, think, I think I appreciate it more now than I ever did when I had a job. Interesting. Okay. And what were your emotions on your last day as the Astros announcer? I was uh, very nervous because um, Reed Ryan, who was my boss, the president of the Astros, wanted to do a press conference before the game. And I didn't think that was necessary. And then I knew they were going to do something during the seventh inning stretch. And I knew people were going to be looking up at the booth. And uh, they had a, a tribute they played. Ben Scully and Jerry Coleman, two of my favorites, were on video. So I just, this was not a comfortable day for me at all. Very, very uncomfortable. And then uh, A.J. Hinch was the manager. And he said, hey, I know you're not going to like this, but come out to the clubhouse with me. All the players were in the clubhouse before the game. He said, hey, this guy has told your story for years. And 
so uh, they all gave me a round of applause. And then Jose Altuve brought me an autographed bat of his that had been autographed by the whole team. So very emotional and not comfortable at all. <laughs> okay, I have a follow-up question. Do you still have the bat or do you have it framed somewhere? I have the bat. Let me get the bat for you. <laughs> Still looks in good shape. Yeah, it's all lacquered up and everything. It weighs about 20 pounds. <laughs> Very heavy. But yeah, really nice play. Does your nickname Brownie have a special backstory or meaning to it? It really does. In, in, in baseball, you know, it seems like everybody has a nickname. So usually it's something you know, that plays off your last name or whatever. Uh, I think Tom Seaver was the first player that I can ever remember calling me Brownie, but it's very, uh, very typical um, in baseball. And uh, I, I think it's uh, I think it's a nice little tribute, if you want to call it that, um, because uh, you know, it kind of means you're one of the guys. All right. Next up, we have Jordan Loki. Mr. Brown, it has been such an honor and pleasure of mine to hear about your long, successful career. I do have to ask, why did you stay with the Houston Astros for over 30 years, including your community work as outreach executive after you went in, after you went into retirement? Well, Jordan, um, when I was in Cincinnati, I thought, man, this is, this is a job I always wanted to do. And it was great. And then I got fired. And so for a period of five years, I bounced around from job to job. I went with two companies that went out of business and uh, then a third, I was with a third company in LA when I got the Astros job. So those five years away from baseball, I, I didn't think I would get back in. I thought, well, you know, you only get so many chances and there are a lot of people competing for these jobs. And I really gave up applying for any kind of job openings when I was in LA because uh, we, we understood that we really didn't want to move our daughter around anymore. We needed some stability for her. She was in, uh, going into high school. So we came to Houston and I thought, and she made me promise that we weren't <laughs> going to move because she didn't want to, you know, after her junior year in high school, she didn't want to move. I said, okay. And, um, and then she went off to Baylor and we still didn't move. And I just, I don't know, the, the longer I spent here, the more grateful I was that I got back into baseball, that they were willing to take a chance on me when I had been a failure, so to speak, in Cincinnati. And I, I don't, I mean, I'm just joking about that because people get fired all the time. It's not the end of life. It was actually very good for me. I learned a lot of lessons that helped me later on. And uh, so I, I didn't want to look for another job anywhere else. This was such a great job. And, and we love Houston too. That's awesome. And it's really awesome to hear about your family. My family are long, long Astros fans, especially I remember growing up hearing my mother and grandmother gush about the killer bees. So of course I have to ask you, do you feel like the Astros have the opportunity of producing another group of players and leaders like the Killer Bees of Fidio, Berkman, and Bagwell? That's a great question. I think uh, they have in, in Springer, who, as you know, is no longer here, Altuve, Correa, uh, but, and free agency is what is the real fly in the ointment here because players do tend to move on through free agency. And it's uh, very difficult to lock up, you know, so many star players under multi-year deals. And, in the case of Biggio and Bagwell, they, you know, did give something of a hometown discount to the Astros so they could stay here. They're really committed to Houston because they loved it so much. And I'm not saying that uh, Springer wasn't, but, um, you know, it just works differently for different people. And um, so I, it, it's very difficult to have a group like this or like the Killer Bees that stays for longer than about three, four, five years in today's game. It's not a Houston thing. It's all over. Uh, players just seem to want to test the free agent market to get the biggest competitive uh, bidding so they can get the biggest contract. And that's kind of the way it is. Not all of them, but many of them do. I can completely understand that. Um, you go where the money is sometimes. 
Now back to you. And now that you're retired, do you find yourself sitting in your living room and commentating games sometimes? <laughs> Not at all. Uh, I had my fill, but I do enjoy the work of others and uh, enjoyed writing the book and talking to the other guys. And, you know, uh, Ryan, you read that too, but uh, these guys are so dedicated to what they're doing. They got me fired up. I almost wanted to unretire by the time I finished interviewing everybody because they, they it's just the, the, the way they approach the craft and the way they uh, describe their training and their schooling and choice of colleges and all these things. I really get fired up. So it's a, it's a great, great profession. But no, I think it's time to, to move over for the younger folks. That's awesome. Thank you so much for answering all my questions. I'm really enjoying hearing about your life and your career. Thank you, Jordan. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, so next we have Tristan. How you doing, sir? Good. How are you, Tristan? Doing all right. It's uh, it's awesome to hear um, just about your entire career. I'm a huge baseball fan myself. Uh, I grew up playing baseball, and you know, because I played it, I have to watch it. And so it's it's really awesome to sit down and listen to your career, like Jordan said a bit ago. Well, you must be a broadcast voice like that. Uh, I do. I I do a podcast, but. Uh, Never really thought about going to, to uh, broadcast, I guess, performance like this. But uh, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Very good. Uh, so my first question is, how did calling games and other sports during high school uh, help you with baseball games later on in your career? I, I think the, um, the idea of being on the air and uh, the pacing of a sport like basketball, faster pace than baseball, is helpful. Uh, football. I, I think it's a great idea to try as many different sports as possible. Uh, in my case, baseball was what I wanted to do, but quite often baseball is not what you get to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and you know, in the case of Eric Nadell, he did hockey. He, hockey was his goal and then he came to baseball later. So we never know what's gonna come along in life to influence our decision or change our decision. And it's not a good idea to do what I did and get locked in, you know, to one sport. Although it took me years to be able to get to do baseball. You know, I wound up doing hockey. I knew nothing about hockey. I did hockey. I did tennis. I did bowling, you know. And, and so that just brings up the point that getting locked into one sport is not a good idea. Uh, so... When, whenever you were doing games, was there anything specific in either all the games that you saw or just in a specific game that uh, made you smile? Yeah, I, you know, there will always be those uh, moments of humor uh, when somebody uh, falls down running first base or whatever. Uh, or, some, you know, on, on TV it's different because they're always getting shots of people in the stands and there will be somebody will spill a drink on somebody else, and there's, you know, uh, I just think that there's always humor. And uh, when I worked with Jim Deshays, we worked together for 16 years and he would always have me laughing and people would say, you know, we, and it wasn't an effort. It wasn't an effort. He just had that much humor. He really <laughs> did. He just had one of those really quick minds and people would tell me they looked forward to blowout games because when the game got one sided, he had this, this other gear mentally that he would shift into. And it was just such an art for him to be able to understand and recognize this game we're doing is not very interesting. It's time to entertain people in another way. And he'd come out with his Seinfeld references and things of that nature. And I, of course, most of the time I had no idea what he was talking about, but it sounded funny. So I'd laugh and um, people told me that they just were, waiting for those games. They would rather have a blowout game than a high <laughs> game because of him. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, like I said, huge fan. So thank you so much for being here. Tristan, keep up the good work on the podcast. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Tristan. Uh, okay, next, we're going to keep moving right along. We have Bastion Gunderson. Hello. Hi, Bastion. Uh, a million people have already said this, but thank you for being here. Uh, it's an honor. And you touched on this earlier, but 
you've seen a lot of technological advancements in media technology and media coverage during your career. Uh, where do you think media technology is headed in the future? It's hard for me to really even guess because I bet my mind is still bent by uh, all the changes we've, we've had to this point. Um, I just, you know, I would have to think that the biggest changes have already happened. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I just, I know that there's a whole different world out there, but the need to, to show the images, you know, the video of the game action limits what can happen with the, with the technology on that television screen on top of that. So I, I'm kind of a nonplussed here to come up with an answer. I just don't have one. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be like you. I'm interesting. Uh, I think it's an interesting time to see what's around the corner, but I have no idea what's there. Yeah, I don't blame you. I mean, we never know what's going to come next until it's there. So it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, my second question is, are there any advantages to spontaneous reporting as opposed to writing a full length script for everything that you need to say? I think there are advantages to spontaneous reporting. Um, it's a lot more difficult and uh, certainly requires a lot of preparation. Uh, you know, when I think of uh, Walter Cronkite uh, narrating those uh, early NASA flights uh, and the amount of preparation he had to put into that, and, you know, the number of experts who had to be on the air with him to, in order to explain things to people in the vernacular, um, yeah, I, I'm a preparation guy. I like to have things written down. Uh, you cannot script sports, but you can have a command of your facts and of the history of the teams and that sort of thing. So uh, I think spontaneity is important. I think a news reporter, you know, covering a breaking news event has to be able to handle that go in that direction and there's some people who are good at it and some people who are better with the with the written script but um yeah you tend to find people do specialize sometimes in one area or another there mm -hmm. that totally makes sense um so my last question is you touched on this earlier too you said that you chose this field when you were about 14 ish which is i wish i could relate i still don't know what i want to do <laughs> okay but uh, what career would you have done if you never chose to go into sports broadcasting or sports broadcasting did not work out? I probably would have been a reporter, either, uh, you know, television, probably, um, maybe radio. Uh, I might have been a writer on a newspaper. Um, but I do like, um, you know, gathering facts, telling the story from those facts, interviewing people. Um, you know, my dad was an attorney and he asked me if I wanted to go to law school after college. I said, dad, I'm sick of school. So, uh, that, that was not my thing, but, um, yeah, I'd, I'd have to say I would have been a reporter probably. Well, it's nice to know that skills from one thing can transfer over to another thing if they don't work out. So that's really cool. They can. So, I, I can tell you this, uh, Bastion, I was, uh, Asked to do the weather on camera one night on TV, and I did not. I did not do it. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been a complete failure at weather. <laughs> well, thank you so much for answering my questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thanks, Bastian. Next up, we have Jordan Johnson. Well, hi, hi. I'm Jordan. Um, I just want to reiterate, thank you so much for taking the time out today to speak to my classmates and I. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, so we can go ahead and head into my first question. What are your thoughts on the Astros sign stealing scandal? And do you think they should have been allowed to keep their title or should it have been strict? I'm writing about that uh, in my next book and last book, 60. Um, and I'm, you know, it's not that I know anything that you don't know. I'm just doing a kind of a journalistic exercise of recording the facts for this book. And I do think that things will come out in years to come that we don't know. Uh, but, you know, as an employee of the Astros and a big fan of the Astros, I wish it hadn't happened. Um, I do think that it puts a stain on the World Series Championship of 2017. 
I do not think uh, the World Series title should have been vacated, um, as had been suggested by a lot of people. But um, this, this thing is uh, it's a monstrous story with many, many layers. Um, and I will try to uh, shrink my comments into just a few seconds. First of all, there, there's, there's been cheating in baseball forever. That doesn't excuse what happened. Uh, there, is, there is cheating on the part of producing uh, tacky substances to trick the baseball. It's, it's not enforced, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, I think Major League Baseball is somewhat complicit, complicit in what happened because of planning all the video cameras around for the use of replay reviews and then not putting any rules into effect about how they're used. I think the rules came along after they realized the teams were using this to cheat. I think probably the Astros players felt that other teams were doing this, uh, but it does not excuse what they did. I feel that the commissioner should have punished the players who did the cheating, but his reasoning was that he had to give them immunity in order to find out all the information behind this. I do understand that. So it's a sad story. It's a sad commentary, um, but uh, I, I just, I, I'm not very happy about it. I don't mind talking about it, but I don't know anything more than has been publicly stated. Well, I'll definitely be looking out for your new book. I'm sure it'll be a very interesting read. Thank you. So my next question is, what has been the most exciting game that you've called? Well, you know, in television, we did not do the postseason games. So we didn't do playoffs or World Series. So those would have been the most exciting games because they had the most at stake. But um, I would say that we went down to the final game of the season in 04 and 05, and the Astros had to win to clinch a playoff spot. So that was kind of similar to the feeling of a playoff game, the Biggio 3000 hit game, uh, the no hitters, um, you know, and, and baseball is kind of, it's a daily drama. You, you come to the ballpark and you don't know what you're going to get. You could get a no hitter. Uh, at any time, and that's what you're telling yourself. Hey, I need to be sharp. I need to be alert because even though it seems like, okay, here we are in late July and there's not a whole lot happening with this season, any particular time, something big might come along. And it might not even be baseball. We had uh, a 52-minute uh, delay in San Diego one time for bees. There were bees that uh, were on a chair uh, where the ball girl sat. I think it might have been from her hairspray. She had long hair that draped over this chair where she was sitting, this folding chair down the left field line. And I think the bees might have attracted, uh, been attracted by her hairspray, but they were just, they stopped the game for 52 minutes until they could get the beekeeper there. Well, all of a sudden, now you're not doing a baseball game, you're doing another event completely. <laughs> And then one time, Larry Durker suffered a grand mall seizure in the dugout, and he was the manager of the team. They had to bring the ambulance over, load him in the ambulance. Game stops. Uh, everybody goes home. Now we're not doing a baseball game either. So it's just, you know, Al Michaels was doing the World Series one time, and they had the uh, explosion in uh, San Francisco, uh, the earthquake. There's the there's there's city was on fire, and, you know, he wasn't doing a baseball game, but he did the most brilliant job of reporting a major event uh, for someone who's a sports broadcaster that anyone has ever done. And that's what I mean. You, you, you just can't prepare yourself enough because anything could happen. Yeah, I bet your experience being um, a reporter and you saying alternatively, if you would have gone to a career as a news reporter, it kind of helped out in those situations. There's no doubt. And, and I think, you know, the principles of reporting, uh, honesty, integrity, fairness, both sides of the story are the same for sports as they are for news. Okay, and then we're going to move into my last question is what would you say has been your greatest accomplishment throughout your career? Um, I would hope that it would be uh, working with a number of people um, trying to make sure that uh, they look good, that they get the proper airtime, trying to show respect for the producer of the telecast and 
trying to show respect for the, the viewers and what they might want to see or the radio listeners, what they might want to hear. And uh, just trying to give an accurate picture of what happened in the game. That day. That's all I have for you today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jordan. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Last but not least, we have Alina Siddiqui. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you doing, Elena? Good, I hope you enjoyed all of our questions. Um, again, yeah. I, th I think I speak for everyone, it is an honor. Um, so let me jump into my first question. What was your favorite Astros game you called? Um, I would say 1999, the last regular season game in the Astrodome because there was all this history involved. And it was another of those games the Astros had to win to make the playoffs. Mm -hmm. But it was not only that, but they brought back all the star players from previous years to say goodbye to the Dome. Willie Nelson sang, uh, turn out the lights, the party's over after the game. All this confetti was coming down from the roof when, and the players were riding motorcycles on the field when they won the game and celebrating. And it was just one of those awesome days. And, you know, if you're around sports for a long time, you know that things are not scripted and they can turn south on you in a hurry. So if they had lost and not reached the playoffs, it wouldn't have been a festive way to say goodbye to the Astrodome. You know? uh, but no, there was this all this old... Just this whole build up to that day and they had a really good team that year but they still hadn't quite secured this playoff spot so they needed that one more win there was a lot of drama with that so I love days like that when you just show up and you yeah, okay there's so many ways that this could not work out right there's so many things that could happen but they did they did happen and it did work it was like a dream day <laughs> that's awesome um my last question did you ever think about leaving the astros to call games for a new team i didn't because i was very happy where i was and uh, you know i was under contract so that meant that i had signed on to be with this team and uh, this is part of what we were talking about earlier with um you know being a professional and maintaining the standards of a professional when you're under contract, you don't snoop around for jobs with other teams. Uh, now, there were times when they hadn't talked to me about a new contract and there was a job open, you know, with another team. And I, I'm not presuming that I'm going to be offered another contract by the Astros just because of the insecurities of our business. You can't do that. Uh, but that doesn't mean you're always, you know, on the phone shopping around for other opportunities. I would say you keep your ear to the ground and you kind of know who's leaving and when there might be an opening somewhere else, but you're not going to pursue it unless uh, you're no longer under contract. Awesome. That is it. That is my last question. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Thanks, Alina. All right. Well, that is all the time we have today. Uh, thanks so much, Bill. Uh, I know thank the you, students Ron. appreciate it and I know we do as well. Um, and I want to thank you, the viewer, uh, for joining us on Dateline Democracy and Media. Um, and until next time, have a great day.